Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike tech and maintenance related questions. As ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible within the allotted time and before Alex's laptop takes off, because it's the fan is it is going for it. That's how tricky the questions are this week. Right, um, David Heathfield 5040 says, I've always found that crank slash pedal based power meters uh, read slightly higher than hub and turbo train power meters. I thought this was due to the power losses through the system leading to lower readings the further down the chain you go. My power meters still read really a good 10 to 20 watts higher at the pedal um, and crank than a tax Neo. Um, I'm not sure I entirely agree with this because I feel like the people that are making tur brands that are making turbo trainers, they've accounted for all this. They're not all of a sudden, oh damn, we forgot to account for the drivetrain loss, surely. No, 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 no. You, you, like, it, it, it's me where you measure the power does affect the reading. Okay, so, right. So, like, you can actually, in theory, measure if you had like a power tap hub yeah. and you had a pedal based power meter. Okay, could, yeah, if, I'm getting if that. If they were bit, both yeah. accurate, you, you, you would, would see the difference. The difference would be your drivetrain loss. Okay, yeah, I can get on board with that. However, that seems like quite a lot of drivetrain loss that he's losing there, which suggests that this power meter might not be totally accurate. I'm always more inclined to believe that, you know, like a Wahoo kicker or a Tax Neo, as yeah. being more, they're generally more accurate. So, yeah. Yeah, while you should be a bit lower there than you are at the pedal, I think maybe your pedal base power meter is overreading a little bit, but who knows. Okay, um, I'll read this next question out because it's aimed specifically for you. All right. Quite often, when you're talking about marginal gains, you, brackets Ollie, this means mm. you, will run through some math on what X watts means over Y time and Z elevation. Is there a calculator out there that can let one play with the what if games like this? Um, ideally, one that can analyze your existing data Say on this ride, putting out five watts more or saving five watts on a new tire. Um, what time would you get? But does this kind of calculator exist? Yeah, yeah. So these kind of, like there's various different systems out there that you can go on. Most of them, um, most of the good ones like, aren't free. But nothing um, in life is free, is it? Yeah, but like there are various things. So you can use things like Golden Cheetah, um, and also like my favourite one is my Windsock, which you know I've mentioned in videos before. Go on there and you can play. With various uh, values, what makes my windsock much more easy to use, though, is when you do actually have some good data on consistent set courses. So it's only as good as what you feed into it. You know, you yeah, can't I think just, that's a good point. Like, actually. it's just you don't really want to analyze your Sunday ride because there's just so many unaccountable, unaccounted for variables. Like the traffic is totally different. The where, how much you spend your time drafting behind your mates, that kind of stuff. It's, it's very hard to like analyze things like that against each other. But for time trialing, great. Yeah. Um, and if you've got wind tunnel or for analyzing your performance on climbs, really good. And if you've got some actual aero testing data that's more quantifiable, so you know your CDA, so from things like um, wind tunnels or track testing, that, and people offer those services, they can measure it for you. That makes your calculations even more accurate when you start playing around. Or different option, just going to throw it out there, head out into the real world and do your own experiments by physically testing it yourself. Rather well, that's than... what you do. You yeah, but you don't have to, you can just do it and monitor your own results, like in the most basic way. Yeah, they? but these tools just allow you to quantify yeah. it and measure it and record it better. Yeah, I'm with you on that, okay. Um, right, next question says, I have an entry level gravel bike with a suspension fork without a lockout. I want to upgrade it to make it faster, especially uphill. Which option do you recommend? A a decent budget or friendly carbon fiber fork, or for the same price, a new set of wheels. Thanks in advance, love the show. Shall I go first? And what I think I yeah, would yeah. do, I would get rid of the basic suspension fork and I would get a decent budget rigid fork. And in that way, I think you've got the right basis and core of what you need. If you're bothered about comfort, you can tune and refine that with your tire choices. And then I would, gradually evolve it and look at changing the wheels. What do you think about using like an upgrade <coughs> fork that is suspension but has a lockout like? Yeah. You that, use some good like sun tools. Yeah, stuff? that is an option. I, I'm trying to think how I would want to say this. So truth, the, in my heart I want to say I don't necessarily feel like a sp suspension fork belongs on a gravel bike, but because I think you can tune it and refine it enough through careful choice of tyres and tyre pressures, 
if you feel like you've maximised what scope you have available with the tyre pressures and the choice of tyres and stuff like that, and you still want more, I think that's the reason where you should then start to look at a suspension for a gravel bike. But at that point, you're also not far off mountain bike territory. Yeah. Um, so I would... I wouldn't jump to having a suspension fork and a gravel bike. I'd go rigid fork, save a bit of weight, and tweak it with your tyre choices. Yeah. I think that's probably the best way of going about it. Cool. Uh, next question is from Emi or Ema06, who says, Hi team, I recently got a new temporary job, which means I'll be driving to work instead of cycling. So my commuter's going to go unused for one to two years. Oh. It's a long temporary job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how is best to prepare the bike for long-term storage? Is it worth doing any maintenance while it's being unused to protect the components? I was thinking of doing a deep clean, lubing the chain, then leaving it untouched until I need it again. It'll be stored in a dedicated bike shed in my garden in the UK. I've got 105 Mechanical, and the components currently have plenty of life in them. Many thanks. I feel like they've kind of half answered their own question here, because I'm inclined to pretty much agree with what they've said they might mm. do and like thoroughly clean everything. Most important thing is drying everything properly. Because if you leave moisture, it's just going to cause corrosion. And then like lubricate and protect any components which are exposed to the air. Because if you leave raw metal out, it's going to eventually corrode. Yeah, I think another thing as well is that, you know, we don't know your specific shed. But <laughs> I, uh, just getting a sheet and covering it yeah. in a sheet is going to be good because it'll keep dust off it and cobwebs and stuff. And um, the other reason why that can be beneficial is it it's actually blocking the light from hitting certain parts of it. Um, UV can damage certain areas. So we know from you know doing a video on this and the shelf life of carbon that that's not really a problem for carbon. Um, the paint could black be as but it paints unlikely to be. The biggest area I'd be concerned about would be like other polymers on the bike. So. Uh, things like your your shifter hoods, your bar tape, and your tyres in particular. Yeah. You know, tyres crack with UV. So, yeah, just making sure that it's covered in a sheet. I'll, I'll block out most of the, the UV from, uh, from, from getting to it and damaging those bits. A um, really quick random story. <clears throat> I used to leave my bike. It always angled one way in the conservatory um, when I was a kid growing up at my parents' house. And it, only after ages and ages it eventually dawned on me that the paint on one side was really faded and the other side was really bright because it was in the light. Alex, that is a cool story. It is. Oh, I'm glad you appreciate it. Um, right, next question. Uh, Jerry McBride says, I got an FTP drop of 15% using Asioma Duo um, or the Tax Neo 2 compared to my original 4i. Um, crank... Power meter. God, um, I'm loving the power meter question. Right, there. so that is, I think, he, that is a, a, a comment we had a couple of weeks ago yeah. where people were, it might have been Jerry McBride, where he, we, he was saying about his, thinks his power meter was under reading because yeah. he's four eye, and we were like, no, we think your four eye is over reading. Yeah, I think that's most likely the situation, isn't it? Yeah. Like we so, mentioned, we've literally just mentioned it. Typically, an indoor trainer is going to be a bit more accurate than a on bike power meter. A lot of power meters aren't like, you know, you, it's quite a common thing that people think their FTP is 400. <laughs> yeah. And it's a sad day when you find out that it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you find out it's 500. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Danny JBR8870 next says, Hi guys, I recently bought a bike that came with tubeless tyres. They're Pirelli Chinterratos. And they seem perfect winter. Are there any safety pitfalls if I use them with inner tubes? They didn't seem... They didn't seem to pop on the rims when I inflated them, even though they were deemed compatible with my wheels. Wondering if it's due to lack of sealant, any help would be appreciated. And well, this is actually a pretty simple answer to this. There is no safety pitfall by simply putting an inner tube inside a tubeless tyre that's on a tubeless ready wheel rim. No pitfalls whatsoever. You're just simply not getting the advantages of a tubeless setup or the hassle. Depends which way around you're looking yeah. at it. Next question is from uh, Jogger, the director, who says, Hi, Ollie and Grunt. I think that's you. <laughs> what? Oh, how's these shots fired? This morning I was going to ride my mountain bike with hydraulic disc brakes, uh. but the fluid was frozen, so the bike was rendered useless. Is this a common winter problem when it's close to minus 10 degrees? Do I need a winter-specific brake fluid? Thanks in advance. Cheerio. Well, based on what you just called me, don't know, don't care. Uh, so. <laughs> I think probably like brake fluid, so mineral oil and like dot fluid, which it depends on what type of system yeah. you have. You haven't said it there. Um, it, it shouldn't freeze at minus 10. 
Um, so the likelihood is that your brake line has been contaminated and has got water in it. Yeah. And that's what's frozen. Uh, so you, you need to bleed your brakes. And um, then it should work and it should be okay. Uh, and the last question this week is from Feli P. Julia, who says, you've talked a lot about who, who dry lubes are cheap <laughs> and the advantages of wax. What do you think about wet lube? With proper care, it's a reliable alternative, even in dry conditions. Well, Whoa. we're over a can of worms here, right. I've actually filmed two videos recently doing mega deep dives into chains and lubricants and mm -hmm. efficiencies with Adam from Zero Fiction Science. So subscribe to GCN Tech, make sure you don't miss out on those in the coming weeks. But um, I'm going to throw it out there that a good quality, like, wet lube is and can be, like, a good alternative. Mm. That's what I want to say. It doesn't mean it's going to be as good. It's probably going to need more care and maintenance, and it isn't going to be quite as efficient, which means your chain is maybe going to wear slightly faster. But I think as the right one is a suitable alternative. Yeah, well, not all wet lubes are equal. Yeah. You know, you can see the independent testing data on it. You, the things like there's, um, like, we use Silka Synergetic, yeah. but there's also the, the one that gets talked about a lot is the Diamond Black. Yeah. Um, Rex, which is really good. A lot of other wet lubes are total garbage yeah. and will prematurely wear your, your chain a lot. But I agree, wet lubes can be, like the good wet lubes, yeah. of which there aren't many, that can be really, really good. And there's definitely an advantage to using those um, for certain people. So if you live in like a really wet place, so like right now in the UK, I've got it's a bike. It's garbage. It's horrible. It's January, it's raining all the time, there's salt on the roads all the time. So I'm washing my bike all the time, after, you know, after like every ride, I need to rinse it down because of the salt. And, you know, that's then washing the wax off because the wax comes off with water. And so rather than having to then reapply wax all the time with the drip on, which you would do like, you have to do that the day before you intend to ride. It's dry. Because yeah. it has to like, the, the water-based carrier has to evaporate. It's so much more practical and easy to just apply a drip on wet lube. Where, so. In those situations, like, yeah, absolutely. But um, if you want maximum performance, and it's not much more, it's just a little bit more, um, wax is the way to go. And if you're riding in dry, clean conditions, yeah. wax is absolutely the way to go. There we go. Um, that was it for this week's Tech Learning. As always, apologies if we didn't get to your question, but be persistent. Keep putting it in the comments section down below. We'll pick it out and we'll get to it in the coming weeks. Love Bye. you. Bye. See ya. This thing's going to take off now.